I was like, maybe I'll go and see one of the other ones. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so, what I thought I would do is um, we can take I can take questions or I can go through what the device does. Piece by piece. Anyone have any questions right away? I just want to know what this thing is measuring, how it's measuring, and what information we're getting from it. Okay. Okay. All it. Does it really want work? Anything in that you wouldn't get? Does okay. it really work? <laughs> well, you know, that's the cool thing about the community aspects of this. You don't have to trust me. You can actually make the measurements yourself. Um, so have you all had a chance to actually play around and touch it, hold it, no, look no. at it carefully? No. Okay, so I'm going to pass this one around, and I'm going to tell when it's actually... I think we're going to need to start this guy up here and talk to him. All right, so let's prime this. So the, both devices have this sort of clamping kind of thing. If you look inside, there, yeah, I'm going to pass it around, but you'll see, because on both sides, there are little LEDs, lights, and sensors. Uh, these are photodiodic sensors. In the LED, the LEDs can be used as a propulse or as what we call an actinic pulse, something that activates photosynthesis in different ways. We use these in combination to um, activate photosynthesis, set it in certain states, and probe its status. The idea is to set the conditions so that you can get different states and probe the effects on light. There are two ways that you can, three ways actually, you can measure the light, the effects on light. One is just simply looking at the light that reflects off the surface of the leaf. Reflectance. Transmission, how much light goes through the leaf. And third is fluorescence. That's the amount of light that's absorbed and re emitted at a different wavelength. Um, those give you all sorts of different pieces of information. You could do this on a, in a static way and just see how much fluorescence came out of a leaf and what was its spectrum. And if you look at the Carl spec, that can be very useful because you can see what. There are GFPs there, different photosynthetic types, and so on. The real interesting thing comes when you change the light conditions. So then you can see the changes that are induced by light, different states, and that can, you can use that to probe various photosynthetic properties. Okay, so and I can give you, go through our, our paper. Um, and go through each case. Doesn't matter, I can do it from memory too. Let's go down to this section here. What can it do? All right. Okay, 
here. First of all, plug intensity R. Um, this is really important. So when you want to measure the light intensity, you don't just measure any light intensity. It has to be the stuff that makes plants work. So photosynthetically active radiation. The issue is that the detector, so that this is a say wavelength, intensity, the solar radiation has this kind of spectrum like that. This is the part that plants use. Your photodiode detectors, so your the that you would get that or you look at the camera has a very different spectrum. It's kind of just like that. And so what you can you can buy sensors from Lycor, for example, that is thinnest your standard and measure very specifically this range. And we do this by um, filtering the detector. This is about a couple grand for one of these. They're very good. We use a different approach. It costs only a couple bucks. It uses an algorithm because we measure using an RGB sensor uh, different wavelength ranges, and then we calculate it. And it's very good. Surprisingly good. So, that allows you to make that measure. Okay, now, as I, if you look in the device, as I said, there are LEDs situated on one side and LEDs on the other side. And there are also these two detectors. This detector here measures light in the infrared. So what it can do is measure either if you put an infrared pulse of light through, you can measure that. It measures, let's say this is at 700 nanometers. It measures all this. Now the nice thing is that that's where the fluorescence comes out. So if I hit with a blue light here, or, or an orange light, the leaf is going to absorb that light, and the light's going to come out with a spectrum that looks like this. And that's coming from the chlorophyll. I'll get back to why that's important later. Chlorophyll absorbs in this region here. Yeah, in the red and the blue. And so if we were to measure the transmission of light here, yeah, right, I said but in the red, oh, and compare it to transmission in the infrared, where the chlorophyll's done absorb, right, we can also look at it in the green. We can compare the amount of light that goes through those, and we can get an estimate of chlorophyll. A very simple measurement. In this case, we can measure, <coughs> this is the clever part. <coughs> we can take a red light, put it through one way, an infrared, put it through the other way. Put a green, so we can, we have both spectral regions, and we use LEDs in both directions. So you're using a bunch of metrics to get the result. Yeah. You can do the same thing for anthocyanins. Anything that has a color, you have an appropriate set of LEDs, you can get a measurement, an estimate, and it can be very good. Uh, another one, okay, so anthocyanins would have a kind of purpley color. We can use the blue, the blue LED, which, which we have one of, we can compare that to a green one, transmission or uh, an infrared. If you wanted to measure something that's that out of the ranges that we have, you can add or change the LEDs. Okay, so that's easy. That's, so it's the same thing as when you use a spectrophotometer. And in fact, you can actually put in a, a little cuvette here. Uh, you can grab, grab, I said it wrong. grab that, and then you can use, if you have the appropriate wavelengths, you can estimate chlorophyll or cytochromes or whatever you want. Very simple. Okay, okay now this is where things are complicated. Um, in this case, we're gonna, we want to measure what's going on with photosynthesis. Uh, and we're going to use the light coming out of the, of the plant. Um, I think we I'm going to need to draw on the board to show what's going on. How many of you are familiar with the, using PAM fluorescence techniques? I'm going to give you a very brief uh, overview, but first I'll show you that if you, in this case, we're going to use two different, three different light sources, maybe four, depending on the situation. Right here. Can you see that? 
we're going to use a red light that's going to simulate the solar light that, that it's hitting the planet. Can I have part of this one for a second? I'll show you what I mean. The first step in the experiment, one reason why it works so fast, is we're going to measure, the instrument's automatically going to measure the light intensity up here. And it's going to automatically reproduce that light intensity here. The color's going to be a little different. We're going to use red, but for a short term, it doesn't make any difference. So we're going to sneak up on the plant. It's going to be in the sunlight doing its thing. And we want to grab it and measure it so that it doesn't know anything happened. The way we do that, instead of having to change the light and let it reacclimate, we're going to measure that, reproduce it, grab it, so within a few seconds we can make a measurement. That's called the actinic light. Okay, the second light we're going to use is a saturating pulse of light. Really bright, it's about 10 times full sunlight. And that's going to do a special thing, that's going to saturate photochemistry. We're going to use a third light, we're going to turn the lights off, we're going to let photochemistry relax, and we're going to give a little bit of far red light. You can barely see it. 730 now. And that preferentially excites one of the photosystems over the other and drains all the electrons out of the electron transfer chain. I'll go into specifics later. The fourth light is orange. It doesn't have to be orange. It could be blue or red. But it's convenient for other technical reasons. That one's going to be given, we're going to give that little pulses of that light, weak pulses of that light, uh, at a specific time. Right. That's going to be absorbed by the leaf, and we're going to look at the light that's re emitted as fluorescence in the near infrared, near, near IR. Why do we do this? Um, each of these pulses has the same intensity. And that's what we want. We want to know what the yield of fluorescence, how, what fraction of that is emitted as fluorescence. And since each one of these is the same, we can measure the intensity changes and see what, cha what changes in yield occur when you change this. Change the properties of leaf. We give pulses of light because we can filter out all the other fluorescence contributions, let's say from the background light. Okay. All right, now here's the basic principle on this. Why do we do this? I'm going to draw a photosynthetic apparatus in a very simple form. Here's my chlorophylls. Light is absorbed by the, this is like a bag of chlorophylls. They're all connected. Okay. Light is absorbed by that, and it's transferred in these chlorophylls randomly almost until it gets to a special set of chlorophylls in something called a reaction center, but in this case, a photosystem two. That's the thing that oxidizes water and makes oxygen when it gets four, four photons. Okay, this is what we want to measure. We want to measure the number of electrons that are going through this, the efficiency, the photo damage, and all that stuff. Here's the thing. If a, if a bit of light is absorbed here, one quantum is absorbed here, it can do several things. It can transfer that energy to another chlorophyll. Eventually, it can transfer it here and do photochemistry. It's called photochemistry. It can also be emitted as heat, lost energy, or it can come off as fluorescence. We can measure this. We can measure that. That's the only thing we can really measure directly. The thing is, the amount of fluorescence we get here depends upon these other factors. So in the steady state, okay, we're going to get a certain number of our, certain fraction of our lights going this way, this way, and this way. This that goes to heat. I'm going to keep talking about NPQ and photoprotection and how the plant is absorbing light and, and wasting it. That's this. When the plant is stressed, it gives off more of that as heat. Right. So the, the more 
of that light goes thin. Because here, or to photochemistry, the less comes out is fluorescence. The trick is to distinguish these things. We can distinguish this one from the rest in a very simple way. This process here is highly light saturated. These are not. They remain more or less constant light. Some caveats to everything I'm going to tell you. Okay. But the simple thing, we're measuring the yield of fluorescence in this state, and we give a very bright flash of light, this will be saturated. Only a limited number of electrons can go here. When that happens, this is blocked, and you get an increase blocked on this pathway. Okay. So that's the very simplest one. This one gives you the famous Phi 2. Quantum efficiency of one system two. And that's equal to the fluorescence, the yield of fluorescence. I'm just going to put it as F maximum with a saturated pulse minus <coughs> the steady state level of fluorescence, the yield of fluorescence divided by FF. Very simple equation. That's my two. Actually, this is, would be so called FP over FF, the maximum one. But if it was in the light, you have to put these little but it doesn't matter. Okay, so simply we're going to measure the yield of fluorescence with a super saturating flash of light and continually to measure. That's why we need the little pulses because that amount of, actually the amount of fluorescence is changing a lot. Saturating pulse has got a lot of light. But we're going to measure only the fluorescence that comes from those little tiny pulses. So that's how it works. So you get traces that, I'm going to expand this. So you get traces that look like that. I'll show you one. Now, I, won't, I can spend as much time on this as you like. Uh, All right. So these are actual traces here. Um, this is the number of pulses on this axis, and this is the fluorescence here. In the dark, the fluorescence yield is low. You put that saturating pulse and it goes way up here. And that's because we're seeing the biggest quantum efficiency in the dark. We apply an actinic light, the steady state light. And it, it, there's gaps in time here. This is just for convenience. But you can see now in the light, this change is much smaller. And that's because photosystem 2 is getting light energy, transferring electrons, and they're being processed ultimately to fix CO2. But that's limited. It's kinetically limited. When they back up, it stops. And the quantum efficiency goes down. But at the same time, that's not what the plant really wants. The plant really does not want that because if you excite reaction centers that have electrons built up in them, you get reactive oxygen species of damage. So at the same time, it activates the MPQ photoprotective pathway that dissipates the light before it can damage. And there's a way to measure this as well. In that case, we would compare, one could compare this level, that's with no MPQ, with this level, and do a similar kind of um, algebraic equation, come up with an estimate for that. Now, there are other equations for measuring how many electrons are stuck on this particular part of the pathway here, and so on. So you have a thermistor there as well to, to verify the equation? A thermistor? Yeah. How, you mean, how are these equations verified? Right. These equations can be more easily verified by comparing electron transfer calculated for this with something like oxygen. I should point out, this is the yield of photochemistry. Let's redraw that. Okay. So what, if I know the intensity of the light times the absorptivity, sometimes called that, times the quantum efficiency, I should be able to count, and times one of the things about, I should be able to calculate the electron transfer rate. So that's a value called linear electron flow, and that's equal to the intensity times cross-sectional area times phi 2. And for systems where you can do this, it's very good. 
So in the ways of Okay, so that this is the standard way of doing that. The NPQ term there, here, is is also the standard way of doing it. Comparing the value in the dark, one the saturated pulse yield in the dark, and in the state state. But that's a big problem on the field work. Has anyone done that? In the field? You do. You got a darker depth of leak for preferably a couple hours, right? <laughs> so people are out there measuring something, and then they'll put a little plant leaf plant thing on it, and then and the leaf is baking, and they'll come back in a couple hours and they'll do it again. So a paper that we're just writing up, we replace those with something that can measure these things in seconds. And we use a different reference point. And that's why we put that far red line on there. If someone wants to know, I will tell you about it. You can recalculate all of those things, MPQ and Phi2, using a different reference point called F0 prime. And that is a state where you dark adapt, you put in a far red light to take all the electrons out. So you know you have this the QA in the oxidized state. Uh, you probe that, and then using mandatory algebra. You can end up with something we call MPQT, which is great. So, uh, but I, I, I'm willing to go through that. But we can go on to the other things if you want. How fast are these things happening? Which things? These, these events in the core blast are, I mean, are the, the, does it matter how many there are? How many or? No. Oh, good question. Um, the actual rates of electron transfer vary enormously from the picoseconds to the seconds, milliseconds. Huge range of things. The rate limiting steps are going to be downstream where you're actually fixing CO2 temperature. The fluorescence parameters that you get here. They are self-normalizing with some small caveats. In other words, this number, all of those factors related to chlorophyll content and the shape of the leaf, and the sensitivity to the detector, they cancel out. Just taking my video, but I keep walking around. <laughs> I can't think and stand still. It doesn't work. Okay, so those, so this is a, a unitless measurement. The light intensity has units, and this thing, if you want it, can have units too, but I would say it's the most peculiar use of fraction. So the only thing here would be is like micromoles of photons per meter squared per second. There's a, there is some need to have units because of the thickness of the leaf and stuff like that. It's not considered. Okay, so that is a good question. So the, the, the experiment, the saturated pulse is usually about a half a second to a second. The dark adaptation thing for getting the MPQT, that's about, we do about six, six seconds, I think it is. It's all together, less than 20 seconds. Okay. More questions about I'm, yes. Okay, so you mentioned how MPQT is uh, calculated, but what about Phi now? Because I know, like, it was actually instituted in the middle. I know it was instituted not too long ago, and that way it got retro calculated on a lot of older projects. Well, you know, it was invented in 2004 by Kramer and all. <laughs> well, no, I'm talking about for the um, multi spec in general, because I remember oh. it wasn't an available measurement, and then I remember it got instituted sometime last year. Oh, okay. Well, Fly and all. You want me to explain Fly and all? I just want to know how the machine calculates it. Okay. Um, in this case, we want to know, we know the quantum efficiency of photochemistry. There's an equation we derive that can tell you the quantum efficiency of NPQ. Phi 2. And we define that if the light is absorbed by the chlorophyll, there's a 100% chance it's going to decay. So phi 2 plus phi n of NPQ 
plus the, what's left over. One. That's how you do it. Okay. The equation for this is related to the equation for this. <coughs> what it means is another story. What it means is the amount of light that's going to come out. This is coming up as heat. You can have stuff that's coming out as heat here that's not regulated. And that's sometimes called KE or non radiative decay. So this is NPQ, this is NO. So the quantum efficiency here is called NPQ, called NO. What does it mean? That's the interesting thing. So in the light or in the under stresses, so you can vary the quantum efficiency of photochemistry by lot. But what you find in healthy plants is that if this goes down, you get an almost perfect increase in this, perfectly balanced. And that makes sense because if, that's, if you don't compensate for that, you're going to build up electrons here, your excitation energy is going to last longer, and you're going to produce bad things. Single oxygen and so on. So if you, and, and I can show you, you know this already, if, you've done, if anyone's done a fluorescence work, you measure the, the, the steady state fluorescence level, you compare that to the dark fluorescence level. They're almost always the same. Very close, right? That's essentially an indicator that phi and O is near zero, or near 20. It's near what it was in the dark, it's constant. So if the plant's in trouble, then it would be, I guess, higher. It's either higher or lower. So in some cases, it overreacts. You imagine it would overreact. Mm -hmm. So it has a stress, and it overactivates this. Huh? So this would go down. Mm -hmm. But if it's broken, or you have too much stress, and it cannot compensate for this, it increases. So someone asked me about PS1. So this is photosystem 2. Is anyone interested in hearing about that? So this one, that phi 2 gives you a good idea of linear electron flow. That means water, flow from water to photosystem 2. Eventually ends up on NADPH H and drives to, to CO2, right? Don't worry about this. Stuff. This is this guy, light is added here, and it's also added here. This is photosystem one. And if you want any more ones I can do more detail. The donor here is something called PC baby. This one, this chlorophyll is 700 nanometers. It's gonna be important. This is important for two reasons. Okay, these two, the excitation of these two centers has to more or less match. It's electrons from here and here. Except under stresses, where you need more ATP, then you activate another process called cyclic electron flow. So you put more energy into this system, and you pump more protons, right? And make more ATP. That's a little technical detail. All I wanted to say is that you have, if you if the plant is under stress, it often needs more ATP. Balance things, and that's caused by that's fulfilled by activating this guy. So we want to measure that. The other reason for measuring it is that everybody knows this is damaged in light. More recently, it's been shown that this can be more important. Under certain conditions, this guy can be killed. So we measure this one in a, in a way that you can similar to this, except that you can't use fluorescence for it. It doesn't give off, this, this whole system doesn't give off fluorescence for this for this. The way we do that is we measure the appearance and disappearance of this state where the electron is removed from that state. You can see this in the near infrared at around 810 nanometers. You need reference wavelengths and so forth to balance it out. 
And that is done in the instrument. I don't have a slide for this one here. By using um, an infrared emitter here, going through the leaf here, and then we use a series, the same sort of series of saturation pulses and far red pulse. Oh, I should say that the far red pulse you mentioned is important because it excites this center, but not very much this one. You, pull, you tend to pull the electrons out. If there are electrons here, and you can actually oxidize this thing. So again, we're manipulating the redox, we're manipulating the system by putting in different pulses of light and measuring, in this case, the absorbance changes, the amount of light that's transferred through the leaf rather than fluorescence. And I could spend another whole couple hours on that one. Okay. Good. Questions about that? Okay, so. Uh, the new device does that P700 measurement really nicely. There's another very important signal. Um, so I would say as indicators, of, as indicators of productivity, this is really nice. It's a direct measurement. Maybe, maybe one could argue it's the indirect, but it's a very close measurement to, to actual yield. Comparing the electron transfer to these gives you an idea of that balance of energy. Cyclic electron flow and photo damage to each of these centers can be measured that way. Okay, then the next the reason why we are so excited about this electrochromic shift scene is this. So I've been drawing this, and I know most of you probably don't know what I'm drawing. There are two really important systems in photosynthesis that are really interrelated to each other. One of those is electron transfer. Basically, photosynthesis works like a, photo, a series of photovoltaic uh, cells. Here's one, and here's another one. This one drives electron transfer through this part of the chain, and this one through this part of the chain. They're a series. And that's great. So you can build up a nice electrochemical gradient and split water, and so on. NADPH. That's not enough, though. You also need ATP. You need to regulate it. And um, that's all done through the second energy storage system, which involves taking up protons on this side of the membrane or, and delivering them over here, here. And those protons build up. And this is a phylicoid, so it's all sealed. They build up in here, and that's used to drive the synthesis of ATP. And you need both of these things to fix the energy. And they have to balance. That's why this cycle, all well, those other things are important. But here's the really important thing. that you need to know if you can measure something in the field. The buildup of the protons here, that's what activates NPQ. Okay. It's a feedback system. So at high light, you get more in that down regulates the system. But it, it's more complicated than that because um, this system needs to respond not only to changes in light intensity, but changes in physiology. In other words, I could have something that could change the temperature. The light intensity is the same. Or I could put it under drought stress. So this system has to respond to the metabolic state in physiology. Right? And those affect this. Under stress, low CO2, low temperature, this thing shuts down, slows down. We have a big buildup of the protons here. That shuts down. So if we could measure this, we get an idea of the connection, the metabolic. We're probing metabolism 
I would make photosynthesis. Fortunately, we can do this. And I'll tell you one, one simple set of sentences here. When the electrons move this way, when the protons move this way, they change the electric field across this membrane. The chlorophylls and carotenoids that are in here feel that change in the electric field, and they change their color just a tiny bit. That's called the electrochromic shift. Electric food can induce a change in the color. It's a wonderful thing because it's linearly related to the field. So you can quantify proton electrons moving this way, protons moving this way. You can also see how active this thing is. And in combination with these other measurements, you can get how many electrons are going this way versus this way. It's like a linear. Very useful technique. It's relatively easy to follow. As, as we said this morning, we've got the only machine in the world that can measure the field, so it can't be all that easy. So that's why that's really important, and we're excited about that. I think that capable. We think that's going to add a lot of functionality, but it also answers my big scientific, my life scientific question. So while everyone's out there measuring their plants for their farms, I'm going to figure out whether I was right or wrong. Okay, um, so the, the current device has an infrared gas analyzer in it. Some of them do. This is it's embedded in here and it acts as a closed system. So you can see the uptake of CO2 or the buildup of CO2 for photosynthesis and respiration. Uh, the new device is going to measure, this is, this, so the uptake of CO2 is a direct measurement of the net assimilation, how much CO2 is actually consumed by photosynthesis. We're going to do it in a different way here with a new device. We can do it two ways. Um, one way is to attach here, the new device has a flow through system that allows you to flow gas over the leaf, and you can attach the ergo on the outside, and you can do it in differential mode. How many people do gas exchange here? So you can do, it's not like a light, but you're not going to get, like, you're not going to be measure CI and all that, but I'll get to that in a second. You're going to measure net uptake. So you can flow this thing, and we're going to have a little a pump or a bellows to actually let it. But there's another way to do this. Uh, and that's how this is going to work. But we, this is in development stage. The problem with the ergo is it takes a while. And it's expensive. The, here's how we're going to do it. We want to measure electron transfer rate. Okay, now the chloroplast that we're talking about, that's here. Inside the you your leaf, and you've got your pores. Right. We want to know how open the pores are, the stomata. If you want to measure assimilation, you can measure it two ways. You can measure it by CO2, or you can measure it by the electron transfer. That's electrons going through the bisco, but you also need to know the internal CO2 concentration. But here's the thing. We can, if we know how open these holes are, we can calculate this from CO2 out here, the flux, and the temperature. You need to also have a model of the visco, and you need to know whether it's a C3 or C4. Yes? I was about to ask that. We would have to take into consideration what type of plant we have. Yes. In this case, you definitely would. But for quick measurements, it's going to, you know if you're measuring Maze to probably C4 uh, or B C3. So, but okay. So, but keeping that in mind. Uh, so, how do we measure this? And you know, this is a, a very usually very typical, very expensive, or very tedious experiment. The new device it does some it does something very simple or will. This is something we could really use the community input and validate this. The flow of air. Going to go over two temperature humidity detectors. Basically. So you know how much with the humidity, the relative humidity, before it went over the leaf, after it goes over the leaf. 
you know the flow rate, and you know the surface area right here. From that, you should be able to calculate the thermal components, the transpiration rate. Wouldn't the uh, heat of the device might affect that? Um, but to in the in this version, we had trouble with heating only on the board itself, where we had some had inappropriately placed a couple of sensors we shouldn't have done. This one doesn't have that problem. But the measurement should only take a few seconds. So long, long, long. Oh, oh. Um, yeah. oh, we also know, we also need to know what the leak temperature is. And right here is a non-contact leaf temperature. That's another way of looking at conductance. So that's the idea. Um, that's it, I think. I don't know what time it is. Did I go over time? By a lot. There's somebody supposed to talk after me. Yeah. Who's that? Two Oh, two oh, oh, sorry. Cubescence is going to influence its flux rate. Too. So, how much you squash that cubescence, etc. So, somehow, one is going to have to determine. Cubescence? Yes, how, how, how fuzzy, how hairy is that leaf? Because ah, it's really yeah. confounding okay. that flux rate. Yeah. Um, so, gas would be prohibited. Yeah, if you had okay. ten, 10 to the minus, whatever. Yeah. So, this is a good question. And I think we're okay, but I would like, okay, in the extreme. So, let, you're talking about the, the measurement of the model conductor. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah, and you're okay across the same species, but you try to compare between species. Mm -hmm. Let's test it, because, because here's my thought, maybe I'm wrong. Because we haven't done this yet, right? This is theory... Okay, we have in series sensor one. Okay, that is just going to measure the air humidity. There's some trick here. Let's see if I'm right. I Maybe there's some very clever people here, okay? Now we have our leaf here. And it's in contact. I'm drawing this in a simple way, okay? Okay. Now, and then we're going to suck the air out here. You have more higher humidity here than here. And this doesn't matter. The flow through here is not important. It's because it's constant. But here, <coughs> we're saying that the resonant time of the air here is going to affect how much accumulates here. What's really so if it leaks through here. Right? Then you're going to be diluting, in principle, the humidity that would have accumulated. However, this is, where I, this is my argument. We're actually regulating the flow here based on the bank. So as long as the transit time for the air from the leak to here was similar to that from here, we shouldn't be too far off. But you're the first person you're going to help me try that out. <laughs> because you said that it's the flow, like how fast or how much the air actually flows back through the second sensor, and that pubescence can actually cause resistance coming back. Well, and you're going to have lack of seal if you've got a fuzzy leaf, too. Right. The question is how long does that air in that region of the leaf here yeah. If it's similar, we should be okay. But if it's not, we have a problem. But that's the cool thing. I mean, again, I want all of you to go out and test it and see where we screw up. Mm -hmm. Where's but I, I, excuse me. Where is the humidity sensor on the exit? It's is it very close to the leak. Yeah. That, uh, otherwise, well, they're right in here. I mean, they're right underneath the surface, built into the case itself. Okay. 
I think that you're, you're right. And the, the key thing that we may have to uh, adjust here is this little gasket. Mm -hmm. And I've had arguments with the development team about these little gaskets. <laughs> you're, you look like you know what you're talking about. So there are multiple <laughs> solutions, you know? It would be very soft. But, but you know, this is so wonderful because you see now we, we, have, we are engaging soft a community and solving well, a problem. It's yeah. totally cool. So what is it that, you know... Like, so I'm, sorry, I don't know if I'm understanding or not. Those two... The two um, valves are, you know, the things that are going to be sensors. putting the air, the sensors here. Mm -hmm. So, the flow of the, mm -hmm. you're going to be putting a little bit of air, right? You're going to be... You're going to be sucking it out. Not oh, you're it. sucking it out? That's important. I should have been very, I should okay. have been very clear of that. Sorry. We're not blowing it. Yeah. I'm just thinking, like, so even it, so if there is no gap and there is no, wouldn't the, the fuzzy still cause some sort of, like, resistance? Um, I'm thinking are you talking about the, the, the surface, the, uh, the, the, the unstirred layer this, uh, this, towards the surface of the leaf? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have a question for you about that. <laughs> I do, because this is, let me ask you that. It's a valid question. Mm -hmm. But, let's think about it, because we're, we want to know what the performance of the leaf is in the environment. So if we have an airflow that's similar to what it experiences out in the environment, mm -hmm. then we're okay. Right. If you want to know, if you want to convert that into a stomatal aperture, then, you know, you've got a problem. <coughs> because you have to consider that. But if I want to know just how much water is being lost from the leaf, mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about it. Right. And, but this is a big difference. The Lycor, their instrument, it has very high flow rates because, not because that's necessary to understand how well the plant's working at a gross level, but because they want to calculate CI and to model the non mesophyll conductance and things like that. We don't, we're not trying to do that. So I think, but I'm open, I mean, so I forgot to tell you that. Um, one of the ways we're pu publishing this is a new kind of publication Stop. called yeah. a registered report. And what you do, it's very cool, it's an open science kind of concept. You put it out there, you have a hypothesis, you put all our data out there, it's published. But then the community can then contribute and test what we've done. And we have no control over whether it works or not. I kind of like that. What, what platform are you putting it up to? Is it the PhotoSync? Repository or is oh, it the, GitHub or the, the, where you're going to make the data public? Um, the the mm -hmm. data is going to be public on, from the, okay, we're doing this through the Royal Society Open Science Platform. Oh, okay. And it's called this, the, they're, they're collaborating with the mm -hmm.